I want to move on to sort of do part two today from last week, or last class. Last class, we looked at the Da Vinci Code um, and the Da Vinci Code's discussion of Scripture, of the New Testament. A couple of handouts coming around. Um, the Da Vinci Code makes equally outlandish claims about Jesus. And some of these, I, again, the Da Vinci Code is not popular anymore, but some of these claims are still embedded in, in the public mind because the Da Vinci Code raised popular awareness of these things. In fact, what the Da Vinci Code did was draw upon a lot of these, these so-called scholarly works that, are, that appeal to the Gnostic documents and that kind of thing. So, so the Da Vinci Code simply put in fiction what a number of so-called scholars are saying today. Now, these scholars, I question the, the appropriateness of even calling them scholars. And the book on your bibliography, the book by Craig Evans. Craig Evans is a true scholar. Um, Craig Evans, Fabricating Jesus, How Modern Scholars Distort the Gospel. Evans is an amazing guy because he, he, he knows, he's learned all the ancient languages, Coptic and, and all these kind of obscure languages, and can read all the documents. In the, he's a remarkable scholar. But he, he really shows how, how the standards of scholarship have, have basically been thrown out the window to make some of the claims that these these so-called scholars uh, are making in these, in these books. And Dan Brown, these are the kinds of books that Dan Brown drew upon. Okay, so it's still worth talking about, about Brown's uh, discussion of, of Jesus in the Da Vinci Code. Okay, novel claims about Jesus. Statement in the book, almost everything our fathers taught us about Christ is false. This is a very clever kind of statement because Brown's target throughout the book is the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, and there's been enough scandals uh, about the Roman Catholic Church in recent history to make people upset with the Catholic Church legitimately, right? However, what the Catholic Church taught about the person of Christ, the person of Christ, we would agree with. It's completely orthodox. So this is a very subtle thing because people are already a little bit skeptical of the Roman Catholic Church because of the scandal with sexual abuse of children by priests and that kind of thing. And now, now you add a theological layer to this, and it's an easy target. And so people want more reasons not to believe the Catholic Church. Here's some, some of the claims from the Da Vinci Code. T. Bing is the historian we talked about last time. He's talking to this young, young woman, um, and he says, my dear, he being declared, until that moment in history, he's talking about the Council of Nicaea, 325, Jesus was viewed by his followers as a mortal prophet, a great and powerful man, but a man nonetheless, a mortal. Not the son of God? Right, Tebing said. Jesus' establishment as, quote, the son of God was officially proposed and voted on by the Council of Nicaea. Hold on. You're saying Jesus' divinity was the result of a vote? A relatively close vote at that, Tebing added. 
Nonetheless, establishing Christ's divinity was critical to the further unification of the Roman Empire and to the new Vatican power base. By officially endorsing Jesus as the Son of God, Constantine turned Jesus into a deity who existed beyond the scope of the human world, an entity whose power was unchallengeable. This not only precluded further pagan challenges to Christianity, but now the followers of Christ were able to redeem themselves only via the established sacred channel, the Roman Catholic Church. Now, that's a misnomer because in 325, you didn't think of the Roman Catholic Church. The division between East and West doesn't come until much later. The Catholic, they referred to themselves as the Catholic Church, but they meant universal church. Okay, so that's minor point. How would you respond to this, these statements, um, just initially hearing this stuff? Sean? If this was true, then why would Christ have been crucified? Okay, so what's the explanation for the crucifixion? Maybe he just angered the political authorities and he was on the wrong side of the, the political spectrum. Jeremy? Well, then he was either a liar or a lunatic. Okay, so we can go back to the trilemma. I think it'd just be, like, well, fine to say that, but look, what did the Bible say? Cause okay. Jesus Christ did this everywhere, even after his death, the centurion said, surely he went to the Son of God. Okay, so, all right, so one of these statements until that moment in history nobody thought nobody thought of jesus as god well is that true is that true to the evidence and you're saying the bible itself shows that that's not true danny the council of nicaea wasn't coming up with wasn't proposing the idea of christ being god it was okay. solidifying um just as a as a uniform um, the, the belief which already existed okay. in Christ was. It okay. wasn't a p p proposition. It was just solidifying what was already there. Good. Um, officially proposed. So no one, what this argument is saying, no one had, it, it never occurred to anyone to think of Jesus as God until 325 when it was proposed at Nicaea. But historically, that's absolutely nonsense. You're right. Uh, Nelson. There, I think there were other writings by uh, by the Pharisees and others who were talking about him in their writings, about him having powers. I, I don't know actually if they said they. I don't know if they said he said he was God. Maybe. Okay. Didn't Josephus talk about his claim to be God? Okay. Yes. Uh, there's some question. There's some debate about the passage in Josephus um, about that, but that's a good line of inquiry. What did others outside of the Bible think about Jesus? What did the earliest Christians say about Jesus beyond, outside the New Testament itself? I kind of get a feeling from this quote that the church is having these councils all the time deciding what they're going to teach now. But the truth is a little bit what Danny was saying is that there was this stir. There was a division between them all. Some, some people were saying that Jesus wasn't God. And so they came together to sort it out and really say, okay, this is really what we believe. Not new teachings or anything like that. The whole was close. Was that really unanimous? Um, yeah. And it, yes. We'll come back to that. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's get a little historical perspective. Now, again, this is just answering the Da Vinci Code, but a lot of these claims, a lot of these claims are equally, th that you find in modern scholarship, are equally bizarre, that you can, you can go to sources fairly easily and debunk these claims with, with real history. Here's another statement by the historian, fictional historian. Um, by the way, if this guy, 
tried to get a job as a historian somewhere, he, everyone would laugh him out of the interview because he doesn't know anything about history. Constantine was a very good businessman. He could see that Christianity was on the rise and he simply backed the winning horse. Was that true? Well, here's uh, some facts. Christianity, from its beginning to about 300 A.D., was a, a minority group in the Roman Empire. Of course, it did have surges of growth, but it was still very much a minority. And it was often persecuted. Um, it was not official policy of Rome to persecute Christians at this point, but it did happen frequently. Now, by this point in history, the Roman Empire was having a lot of troubles. There were attacks by the barbarians. There were natural disasters. There, were, there was all kinds of, of problems. And an easy scapegoat was the Christians. Some argued that the gods are upset because the Christians have been allowed to continue, and they're the problems of the empire. So from 303 to 311, there was something called the Great Persecution, and this was an attempt to systematically eliminate Christianity by brutal persecution. Um, however, even eventually, even the pagans grew tired of the bloodshed, and they, they couldn't wipe out the Christians completely, and so they relented, and the Edict of Toleration was um, issued in 311, which allowed the, uh, allowed the Christians to exist. So they said, okay, we'll let you exist. We're not going to try and wipe you out anymore. Toler we'll tolerate you. Now, all that as background to this statement that Christianity was on the rise and Constantine was just a good businessman and he put his money on Christianity. Well, in fact, right before, Christi uh, right, right before Constantine came to power, the state had tried to wipe out Christianity. Now, that does lead us to Constantine, and Constantine uh, figures prominently in the Da Vinci Code. Constantine, however, really honestly believed that the God of the Christians helped him come to power. He believed it was God's will, and God was the one who helped him become emperor. And so he honored the Christian God when he, when he came to power. And he issued something called the Edict of Milan, which in 313 legalized Christianity. It didn't make Christianity the official religion of the empire, but it did support Christianity and gave it full legal status in Rome. So, what about the Council of Nicaea, 325? Well, a debate about the person of Christ uh, got really heated by about the year 318, and the debate was spreading among the Christians, among uh, people in the empire. And so Constantine said, okay, there's got to be a council held to resolve these issues and to give the official position of the Christian church. Council took place in Nicaea up here. The controversy started down here in Alexandria by... Uh, a priest by the name of Arius, okay? And Arius taught that Jesus, the second, who we call the second person of the Godhead, was not fully God, that he was not eternal, that in fact he was a created being. There was a point when he did not exist. God the Father brought him into existence, and then through him, create, Jesus created everything else. Okay? Um, so that was Arius' teaching, which, by the way, that's what 
modern Jehovah's Witnesses teach today. Now, the result of the Council of Nicaea was to reject this view because everyone, uh, everyone, Arius had a few supporters who, uh, some of his supporters didn't really understand the issues. Uh, the, this whole council and the results of it are, are complex. Take church history if you're interested in it. We get into it more. But virtually all the, the, pre, uh, the, the bishops believed in the deity of Christ, so they were somewhat shocked to hear this blatant rejection of the, of the full deity of Christ. And Arianism officially rejected, or, or the council officially rejected Arianism. But your question it was not a closed vote. 316 to 2 or somewhere in that na- nature. We're dealing with antiquity, so you see different numbers, but all the numbers are of this proportion. Okay, Overwhelmingly, everyone signed on to the Nicene Creed. So... Is Jesus God? The fact of the matter is, Jesus was viewed as divine from the very beginning of Christianity. This is challenged in in, um, Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code. It's challenged by modern scholars. It's challenged at a number of levels, but it's challenged in the face of a whole lot of evidence affirming this fact. In fact, someone, a couple of authors writing a response to the Da Vinci Code said this, for one thing, this seriously undermines the credibility of Teabing's character. For any historian, whether Christian or not, knows that the early Christians most definitely believed that Jesus of Nazareth was somehow divine. Okay, the second century Christians didn't always know how to put his deity together with the Father and the Holy Spirit or his deity together with his humanity. They hadn't worked out all the theological kinks at this point, but they all affirmed this. Okay, Uh, I gave you a handout, the deity of Christ, that lists a few samples of statements from second primarily 2nd century writers, 2nd, 3rd century writers, affirming the deity of, of Christ. Okay? Um, just a couple of examples. Clement of Rome, Brothers, it is fitting that you should think of Jesus as of God, as the judge of the living and the dead. Number four, Irenaeus. Thus, he indicates in clear terms that he is God. And that his advent was in Bethlehem. God then was made man, and the Lord did himself save us. Um, Tertullian on the back of the page. For God alone is without sin, and the only man without sin is Christ, since Christ is also God. Fact number two, and and, um, you all, I think Jonathan, you raised this point. The New Testament, the early Christian documents, affirm Christ's deity in a variety of ways. Um, You have it. You have it there on on your handouts. The different categories. He's called God. He is given divine titles. He does. Works only God can do, creation, forgiveness of sins. He possesses the attributes of God. He's worshipped as God. So many lines of evidence in the New Testament. Let me just draw your attention to one. Okay, because this is one that is challenged by JWs, right? JW comes to your door and you want to... You wanna present to them what you think is the clearest verse on the on the deity of Christ and that would be what John 1 1 and they say to your shock what 
Yeah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you think that's the trump card. What can they say? And they say, oh, yeah, you just don't understand Greek. Because in the Greek, the word God there lacks the definite article. Therefore, it means Jesus, or the word was a God, which simply means he was sort of like an angelic being. Okay, now there's lots of technical things you could say. Any uh, Greek students know, remember the technical uh, rule? Jeremy? And an Arthur is pre verbal predicate noun in terms of noun equality. Very good. Aren't you impressed? An Arthurus preverbal predicate nominative is usually qualitative. Don't worry about it. <laughs> all, you can, all you can say is, no, there's good reasons in the Greek for, for taking it as the traditional translation, and the word was God. Now, let's say you don't know Greek. There is a way to still talk to the JWs from John 1. Okay, and I want you to see that because this is very important. I think John clarifies some things for us that that rule out the JW view. The JW view is the same as the Arian view, Arius, that that Jesus was the first created being and then everything was created through Jesus. But notice what it says, verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Okay, so what is verse 3 saying then? How would you explain it to the JW at your door? We had the ability to create everything okay. before everything. Okay. What? Okay. Okay. All things were made through him. JW say, yeah, we believe that. Jehovah created Jesus, and then Jesus created all Jehovah created through Jesus. But John doesn't let you get away with that, because all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So everything in the made category, everything in the created world, created category, is made through him. That's the point of the second line. And without him, nothing was, was not anything made that was made. It's a very powerful text to demonstrate that Jesus was not created because anything that was created came through Jesus. Okay, now, here's a big, a big uh, issue in the Da Vinci Code. Was Jesus married? What would you say? Of course not, right? But what? It speaks on silence. It's an argument of silence. Okay. It doesn't, talk about, it doesn't ever talk about anything. Okay, right. The Bible makes no mention of Jesus being married. Although it does state that Peter was married. In other words, this is a bit of a hard thing for the Catholics, right? The first pope was married. But it's not a hard problem for, um, for this question because, you know, the Bible's not ashamed of, of marriage. God created marriage, okay? So if Jesus was married, you'd expect some, some word about it. Now, this quote is significant because it's made by Bart Ehrman, who is by no sense an evangelical. In fact, he has rejected evangelicalism and describes himself as an agnostic. And this is what he said. Not a single one of our ancient sources indicates that Jesus was married, let alone married to Mary Magdalene. All such claims are part of modern fictional reconstructions of Jesus' life, not rooted in the surviving accounts themselves. Chris? Hey, where did the claim come from that Peter was married? Well, Jesus healed his, his mother-in-law. And in, was it 1 Corinthians 9? Paul says... 
I, don't I have a right to take along a believing wife as does Peter and the other apostles? Or Cephas? Yeah. Jeremy? Where did the idea come about that Jesus was married? Was that the Da Vinci Code? Da Vinci Code, but again, Dan Brown was drawing on other books about the Gnostic documents where they sort of try to make huge leaps to suggest Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. Um, but even Ehrman says that is not credible at all. If you actually read the sources, it's huge. It's huge in terms of making wild leaps of logic to deduce that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. This is my own personal opinion, but if someone was to ask me, was Jesus married, um, I think I'd say something like, you know, part of the purpose of marriage is to become Christ-like, and he was already God, so he didn't have anything to work on. He didn't have anything. <laughs> <laughs> Luther would agree with you. For Luther, marriage is a school of character. So, but um, I heard an amen from a newlywed. Um, now, another point here. At the crucifixion, Jesus showed special concern for the care of his mother, but not Mary Magdalene, even though she was standing by the cross, according to John 19.25. So if, if Jesus had been married, wouldn't you expect him to show some consideration for Mary? Don't you think that Mary Magdalene, as opposed to Mary, the mother of Jesus, would have been honored by the church in a special way? if he had been married to Mary. Now, the Da Vinci Code's explanation of that is simply that um, the church went on a smear campaign to denigrate women. And the, remember the sacred feminine? So that's the explanation. Now, why doesn't that stand up to history? In comparison with the culture, Christianity treated women very well. Okay, that's been a point that's brought out uh, by sociologists recently. Rodney Stark makes a very compelling case for that. But there's another basic point. What Think of Roman Catholic theology. Mary, the mother of Jesus, the Blessed Virgin, right? From f real early on, she was honored in a special way by the church. We would say as Protestants to an, er an erroneous, in an erroneous way, right? She was given way too much credit co-redemptrix that comes a little later but um, so it wasn't like the church was set out to denigrate women because they elevated Mary the mother of Jesus yeah. well, the testimony of the women who came from uh, the tomb right right Christians weren't afraid to say yeah women, women told us all four gospels report that it was the women who first uh, Jesus appeared to first right now, here I think is one of the most important points, and it's sort of related to um, Ana Lucia's comment, and that is the purpose for Jesus coming. Okay? The Son of God came to earth not to start a family, but to save the church, which is his true bride. So in response to the question, was Jesus married, you might say, He has a bride. He does have a bride. And this is actually an opportunity um, to bring in the gospel and under, understand, or under, uh, sorry, explain the purpose for Jesus' coming. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, and the church is considered the bride of Christ. In fact, all of marriage is a picture of, of Christ and the church, according to Ephesians 5. So this is a, this is a very powerful way, I think, to um, present the gospel to people and help, help people understand why Jesus came in the first place. Bring in sin and Jesus comes to reconcile us to God and to 
purify for himself his own people. And, and so uh, always look in these apologetic issues. Here we're responding. We're, this is sort of a defensive posture. We're responding to claims that are made with truth. It's part of the, our role in apologetics. It's a big part of our role. But always in apologetics, you're looking for strategic opportunities to bring in the gospel. Because that's we don't just want to win a debate or defend an argument. We want to present people with the central message of, of Christianity, the glorious message of the gospel. Thank you.